This is an audio-visual podcast for Vision Week New Zealand, starting June 8. This is the final part in a four-part podcast series on using spatial planning and urban geography, ranging from interregional planning to regional, sub-regional, community, right down to site level planning, and how it can be used to uh, influence and inform our spatial and urban forms and the behaviours that go with it. This is due to that Vision Week. It's about creating an ambitious long-term vision for New Zealand for our lifestyles, including economic, social, cultural, and environmental outcomes. So the reason why I chose spatial planning and urban geography is I'm taking it right back to the beginning, right back to the top. Because if we cannot get the planning mechanisms in place, the spatial planning mechanisms in place, then everything else is going to be misfiring straight off the bat. Whatever you propose or want to bring through or to evaluate, it can't be done, Um, especially when we're evaluating our lifestyle, including economic, social, cultural, and environmental outcomes, because you don't know, we don't know, how the spatial form and and behaviours that go with that spatial form are going to interact and influence those other ideas. So I'm taking it right back to the beginning. Again, this is part four of four of a podcast series that I have done for Vision Week New Zealand. I've got the links down below in the YouTube video, as well as in the PDF attached to this PowerPoint presentation of all four podcasts. Each podcast can be treated on their own individually, or they can be run together as the four-part series. They're flexible in either way. So let's get this final podcast on the road. Remembering, as we said in the first podcast, transport begets land use, land use begets transport, and both beget the user environment in a city. And just a little bit about myself, where I reside here in southern Auckland. I'm an urban geographer, spatial planner by profession and trade, and have done advocacy work including for large projects such as the El Monaco trans- uh, Urban Renewal Project to the airport to Botany Rapid Transit Line to smaller projects such as street calming, parklets and bus stations. If you would like to pose a question, comment or start a dialogue, you can reach me at ben at collab.nz. So let's take it back to the my bounce forward vision on how I see or New Zealand, which Aotearoa, and how Auckland should be going going forward. So the 20 minute city that's evolved into the 15 minute city, but it, it, for 15 to 30, 30 minute city. So for sake of argument, we will do the 20 minute city as Paris has argued for the elimination of the super commute. Now any commute over 30 minutes long is deemed from your home to work is deemed a super commute. I am also going to extend it that 30 minutes for the most basic of amenities. If you're spending more than 30 minutes commuting to get the most basic of amenities inside an urban environment, so it doesn't count rural, it's also deemed a super commute as well. And better integration and cooperation rather than competition between the regions, particularly the Golden Triangle. As I'm doing this podcast, Hamilton and uh, Hamilton and Tauranga are talking about how to beef up their transport connections to make use of the port of Tauranga and Hamilton with its inland freight hubs. Uh, the re-emergence of industry, especially uh, manufacturing is coming back into New Zealand again, but more to the point, the creative industries. Walkable and transit oriented environments and how they attract jobs. And of course, this presentation is also a follow-on from my first podcast. This podcast is basically tying up the other three by looking at complete uh, neighbourhood planning. So we're looking at building complete neighbours or complete neighbourhoods. So in Auckland, and most likely elsewhere, but I'm speaking in Auckland's case, there is a tendency to struggle with building complete local neighbourhoods. So in my first podcast, we were at interregional level of spatial planning. In the creative industries one, we dropped down to site-specific and sub-regional looking on the employment side of the ledger, 
and the third podcast looking at um, walkable um, areas. Again, that was site specific, but we're looking at the residential side of the ledger. And in this one, we are crossing all four or all five levels, which I'll go into in, a, in an upcoming slide. But basically, that is where neighborhoods, we're looking at where neighborhoods, uh, where the residents have most of their requirements fulfilled locally. So local amenity. Local amenities. So you're trying to avoid, again, that super commute across the city for your most basic of amenities. Because this allows the realization of the 20 minute city through the provision of those local amenities. And I'm going to give it a set of definitions that I use when I do spatial planning and urban design, especially around local and in how it can, but they can be applied universally elsewhere as well. So building complete neighborhoods or building complete neighbors. The four definitions that I use are interregional or between two cities and regions. For example, Auckland, Waikato and the Bay of Plenty, otherwise known as the Golden Triangle. Regional, so that's Auckland itself. And the reason why I've mentioned city skylines is it's going to come up in a minute on the urban simulation side. Subregional. So I reside in the subregion of Southern Auckland, Southern Auckland being the largest and fastest growing subregion in Auckland and of all of New Zealand. And then local, which in this case is the easiest way to do it, is drop it down to the one of the 21 local board areas that Auckland has. Outside of Auckland, that will be your community boards. Although you've just got to remember they, how community and local boards might be defined might not neatly fit over how communities might define themselves. So just be aware of that, but for the sake of this argument, we're just going to do it at local board level and use the local boards to define the local areas as much as it can be an artificial uh, social construct. So I am aware of that bias and tendency. Now, one problem that you that is apparent in Auckland, and it is at the moment again, and it can be apparent elsewhere, is the monocore, or monocentric city centre planning. And this has problems for two reasons. One, most of your resources are tied up to the city centre with little played or you or planned elsewhere. And consequently, remembering transport begets land use, land use begets transport, your transit planning, and this is very true with Auckland at the moment and with Auckland transport with our transit system, is it revolves around the 9 to 5 Monday to Friday commute with sub substandard off-peak and weekend services. Substandard is anything above longer than 15 minute frequencies across your main lines and even your feeder lines. Local lines I can expect to be on demand, but your feeder lines and your main lines should always be at least every 15 minutes off peak and at least every 10 minutes on peak. So our transit system still radiates out from the city centre and it's still we have this twin peak system. So it's still technically serving the city centre. And until the eastern busway, the northern, uh, sorry, northwestern busway at this rate, and airport to Botany are built, which are the cross-town services, we've still got this problem. And then we've got the problem of Auckland Transport in the name of revenue, um, slashing evening and weekend bus services. And so as a result, the sub-regions, and not just southern Auckland, although I'm using it this now, all the sub-regions miss out. If your buses and trains are more than every 15 minutes, then transit doesn't become your first viable option. You should be able to walk up to a transit stop and not have to worry about a time jump, especially when you've got kids, especially if you're the elderly, especially if you are a woman or from the LBGTI community. Okay, you Basically, if you're not a male, the transit system at the moment doesn't work for you. It, it just doesn't know it's and this creates problems in trying to build complete local neighborhoods and why a lot of why 
about anywhere between 87 to 91 percent of the commutes across Auckland are still by car, which is extremely high. On the urban form side now, local centres and town centres are often closed on the weekends. Now there's for and against arguments from this. Closed on weekends means family time, but at the same time, those who do the nine to five office job, although that's pre-COVID, how it works in post-COVID is yet to be seen, means they don't have access to those town centres, so they are more likely to go to a metropolitan centre, which is likely to have a mall. And remember, at the moment, New Zealand is going through this big buy local, support local campaign in the post-COVID era. That said, it's not all bad for the metropolitan centres, because six of the metropolitan centres, six out of ten, sit on our rapid transit network, with a seventh about to join. That's Botany, once the Eastern Busway, and used to be called, uh, I called it the Sydney Airport Line, but it's A to B, the airport to Botany Rapid Transit, are both built and providing we don't see any cuts in funding, should be both operational by 2026. The major consequence then becomes the lack of planning with our sub-regional metropolitan centres, despite the fact six soon to be seven, and the other three won't be far away either, including Westgate, are not sitting, uh, they sit on the rapid transit network, so... They should be able to be, if we do need to go to them in the weekend, because the town centres are closed, then we should be able to use our transit to do so. But again, because our planning is still focused around the city centre, where most of the resources end up, and the 9 to 5 Twin Peak Monday to Friday commute, uh, our local neighbourhoods become isolated. So even if the town centres were to open up in the weekend, they're not supported by quality transit. And our metropolitan centres become choked with cars because, again, and if they become choked with cars, it means parking needs to be righted. And if you're providing parking, your opportunity cost becomes uh, what could be built in its place because it is expensive to sink parking underground. And so without that quality transit, your urban form suffers. Local neighbourhoods become isolated. Your metropolitan centres become um, infested with cars. For more see walkable and transit orientated developments, they attract jobs. Again, businesses overestimate the power of the car and what they bring in and underestimate what transit brings in. From Jeff Specht, how many cars can we move? How many people can we move? Why do we need to move people at all? Put their daily needs close to hand. So daily needs translates to local um, basic amenities. Their basic amenities should not be no more than a 10 minute um, walk away or if need be a 10 minute transit ride away. If you can support local amenities, the case of doing cross town commuting for those basic am amenities is removed and that can be that can be freed up, that road space can be freed up for other uses. Now, this is from 2018 from Strongtons. This is where the 20 minute city came from before it evolved into the current 15 minute and jumps back to 20, 15, 15, 20. Imagine if you were able to accomplish your daily activities from getting to work to buying your grocery all within a short walk from your home. We sh now, I know they're doing this in North America, Asia, and the EU, but we don't do this in New Zealand. We should be striving to do the 20 minute village. So again, are we asking the right questions when it comes to complete neighbourhoods? Andrew Price of Strong Town points out that cities are divided into neighbourhoods. So you're now dropping down to your local. And if you've ever spent time in a walking or living in a walkable city without a car, you'll know the quality of life is dependent on the amenities within that neighbourhood. And it goes through a good neighbourhood would have enough local amenities as listed here, so schools, parks, grocery stores, walk-in clinics, entertainment, that, within 20 minutes. So my ba most basic needs should be, be able to be provided in Papakura and Takanini, with periodically going into Monaco, the larger metropolitan centre. If that's not the case, then I am with the substandard off-peak and week tra week weekend transit uh, services we have here in Auckland, of course, my first inclination is to be jumping the car and off to Monaco I go, contributing to congestion. Remember, 
I'm not stuck in traffic, I am the traffic. But I've been given no option due to our poor uh, spatial planning and our poor transport planning. So we're not building complete neighborhoods. And, it's and it has informed our spatial form, which is car parks and roads, which then leads to my behavior being, I'm going to drive everywhere. And then that feeds back into more parking, more roads, which means more congestion. That's And we know it is induced command. Whereas a good neighborhood, again, will have that variety of restaurants, along with schools and parks. So that's your civic infrastructure. Your grocery stores, it doesn't need to be a big, big supermarket. It could just be a small little metro class. That's all it needs to be. Or even dairies if you want to. Walking clinics, so you don't have to wait for an appointment for your GP. And entertainment. And there's an example here of this is a complete neighborhood. You will note this is mixed use. Com uh, residential, commercial services, commercial retail. Not single use. Mixed use. And if you want to know more about mixed use, see my second and third podcasts respectively. Going on. A good neighborhood will not only provide those local amenities, but you shouldn't need to worry about the curfew of the transit system shutting down either. In Auckland, it's 10 p.m. Uh, Sunday to Thursday, then I think it's 1 a.m. at best on limited services for Friday, Saturday. Also having to worry about Uber surcharging in the wee hours of the morning. There's also another thing called the linger factor. You are more likely to linger in hospitality spaces and thus retail spaces than back to hospitality spaces if you catch transit rather than the car. Why? Drink driving is usually a good one, but it's also just the mindset as well as not having to worry about four hour limited parking when you've got unlimited time if you use transit. But it should be noted in building a complete, so I, if I build this complete neighborhood, it doesn't mean I'm never going to leave. It's not going to be a fortress. And of course, I am going to explore, want to explore the other areas of the city, city, especially when I've got family in West Auckland and other parts of South Auckland. And I'm going to do that. But the point being, my local amenities are provided close to home with an access of transport, transit, and active modes near 24-7. So my inclination is to use those services, then rather use the car and contribute to the traffic, because I am the traffic, and going into Monaco. Transport begets land use, land use begets transport, both beget the user environment. And as you can see here again, the complete package. Mixed use. Mixed use. Not single use, apart from industry, because of its adverse air and water quality effects. Mixed use. It is safe, especially for the, our minority and the vulnerable. Are schools provided nearby? And this is this is more common with the metropolitan and city centres. Parks? Child care? This is a big one that can get missed. And I'm not talking about private child care. I'm also talking about public funded child care, which is kindergartens here in New Zealand or the Commonwealth. Community? And housing typologies across the board, from single to multi to terraced. And then that we're going to jump back out to the hierarchy. And this is the hierarchy that Auckland follows per the Auckland Unitary Plan, which also stems out of the Auckland Plan. So this is the hierarchy from the city centre to the metropolitan centres. We now have the nodes included which serve the big sub-regions, to town centres, to local centres, to neighbourhood centres and shops. So the Auckland plan and the unitary plan has it all laid out. So it is trying to inform our spatial form and our behaviour. So it, the Auckland plan and the unitary plan through this is trying to inform how our spatial form thus our behaviour should be. It's trying to inform us that, yes, it recognises complete neighbourhoods, here, here, and here, but it is also recognizing that we are going to traverse out of them and visit our metropolitan centers and visit the city center, whether that's Auckland or Monaco city center. But what lets this down is our transport 
system that's still geared for the Twin Peaks and the city centre only. So we can't do complete neighbourhoods while the transport component's missing. So we've got the urban, the spatial planning side of the component there, but we don't have the transport side there to build a complete neighbourhood. As I said, nodes were added into the hierarchy. So you uh, have the city centre, and I'm going to run it per the Auckland plan scenario, not my scenario. So you've got the Auckland city centre. Then you had the 10 metropolitan centres, town centres, local centres, neighbourhood centres. And that was in the Auckland plan 2012 and the unitary plan. Well, in the Auckland plan 2015, uh, 2050, sorry, which was done recently, they chucked in the node to which Monaco became one and is the largest of the three nodes, Albany serving southern Auckland, Albany became the next one serving the North Shore, and Albany and Rodney, and then Westgate serving the West. The reason why there's not on the IFMAS is you've got Auckland City Centre itself. And these nodes would be the equivalent of a super metropolitan centre, so a hybrid between a metro and a city centre. And the reason why the nodes came up is because they, a metro centre well serves a sub-region a node can not only serve a subregion, but it's also recognised it can serve regional as well. So in this case, the Monaco is the node for the south of high accessibility to significant employment areas, commercial, civic, and industrial. So it's a very unique node in that because we've got the big industrial complexes of Wuri, the airport Puanui once that gets developed, East Tamaki and Highbrook, and if you want to push it further, Otahu. As an established area, it plays an important civic, retail, and education and cultural role. Southern Auckland recognises Monaco City Centre as its core. It doesn't recognise the Auckland City Centre. So this node takes into account. So this, again, gets to inform the spatial form of the South. It gets to inform the spatial form of Monaco. And it gets to inform our behaviours and how we interact with the South. Given, again, civic, retail, educational, cultural. And if you go back to Vision Week New Zealand, creating an ambitious long-term vision for our lifestyle, including economic, social, cultural, and environmental outcomes. Now, all, uh, as the running theme is, Auckland struggle, struggles with its complete neighbourhoods. As you see, the Auckland and Unitary Plans spell out how it's meant to work. So we've got the special planning side right. But the transport side is um, not as to be desired. But there's also another part I've left out. Our local boards. Local knows local. So local should fund and advocate and build for local. Our local boards here are not funded properly to allow the proper upkeep and renewal of our local and town centres, which they have stewardship of. They do in part of the metropolitan centres, but because they're so large, often the central council organisation will kick in as well. And so as a result, the local board's mega resources get overwhelmed. And they are at, they are at the mercy of whatever the governing body of Auckland Council, the central organisation at Auckland level, is, um, gives them. So we've got the local component missing there as well. Local knows local, local builds local. Yet they can't if they're not properly resourced. And our local boards here in Auckland look after the local parks, the local transport um, system in coordination with Auckland Transport and local amenities. I said local knows local and they do planning with this every three years so the local boards need to be autonomous and bulk funded and be allowed to set targeting rates which might require a change of central government our local boards just need to be left to do their job without being mothered by the by the governing body of Auckland Council. Let Auckland, the governing body focus on the metropolitan centres and the big regional stuff. Let the local boards focus on the local and fund them 
properly because they are expected to do ca the capex side, the capital expenditure, and the opex side of the coin. So if you want to do local, and if you want the locals to respond better and help build complete neighbourhoods, then make sure the local boards are properly funded and are left to be autonomous in their local matters. So what to do? Spatial planning influencing behaviours in urban form. And I'm going to use the urban simulator as an example. So we're going to crank out Paradox and Closer Order City Skylines because it's a nice visual simulator and tool to use. Limitations and bias, of course, acknowledged. So while I don't have local boards per se, so while all power resides in the local office, you can set up districts which look after in a semi-autonomous way what happens inside those districts. And that applies to transit and urban form. So transport begets land use, land use begets transport, and both beget the user environment. So I can set the policies in the district on how I'm going to control the transport and the land use and how they're going to interact in the user environment. So I can use this to complete um, creating complete neighborhoods. So often outside of the Twin City centers, including the downtowns, this is the way the game works, um, we're going to drop down to sub-regional and local level to make sure each district, unless it's a primarily industrial district, which can happen, which is also fair enough, um, these districts are near self-sufficient, meaning if you go back here, everything, all the local amenities should be provided in that district, and the transit system should be operating so people don't have to worry about a curfew. So yes, and most, and um, at least half the transit system runs 24/7 with the frequency altered accordingly. It's not uncommon for me when I run the simulator to have buses more full at three o'clock in the morning on Wednesday than it is at eight o'clock on, on a Monday or Friday morning. So again. The districts are nearly self-sufficient. Maybe 90% of your activities can be done within the districts. So basically, I'm applying the 20-minute city to the simulator. You give further context. All districts have local transit and active mode infrastructures that both are provided, allowing most of the population to walk or transit within their local destination. The leisure and tourist districts outside the city centre are spread around as well. So um, major entertainment and hospitality and locations will still be within 30 minutes. So that's the equivalent of me going from Papakur to Monaco for major entertainment and hospitality rather than go, spending an hour getting up to the city centre. And here's um, some examples. And you can also see the road hierarchy. It's like a build to complete neighborhood. So you've got two pieces coming into play here. You've got the road hierarchy, which I mentioned in the previous podcast. And you've also got the complete neighborhood situation. So we've got two here. And two that are a bit different. So over here. We're building up a tourist and leisure area, and here is just your run-of-the-mill uh, district. Now you can see, using the road hierarchy and building the complete neighbourhood, you've got the four-lane roads that form super blocks. And this is where often the local transit will sit. Around that again, you'll have the big six-lane roads, and in this case, cycling superhighways and heavy transit connecting up each of what are basically urban islands. Urban islands are complete neighbourhoods. And then in between, you have the local roads or local uh, pedestrian or transit malls serving the 
residential and commercial areas. So now coming down to the zoning wise. So in this case, we've got residential and we've got a lot of civic infrastructure. So the residential will be on the smaller roads. Periodically, they might be on the four lane roads, but they will never be on a six laner. And you have your local transit running around. And then you've got your big cross city or intercity transit. After that, what can't be seen is the underground metro. But the commercial, in this case, so local commercial will be on the four lane roads. I don't put them on the six lane roads because it generates tra localized traffic congestion. So your commercial's there. So if you live here, you're able just to quickly go across to this residential uh, commercial area here and back. From here, it's here or down here. It's just out of picture. If you need a big retail item, so here is the Grand Mall, you you can leave the urban, this your complete neighborhood. So you, the complete neighborhood has got parks as well. And it has the civic infrastructure in place. So there's a, uh, that's a library in this case. And uh, there are the schools there, there, and there's a high school down here. But if you need to access things that are in the Grand Mall because it's not supplied locally, well then you just make your way up. And you've got two choices to get in there. You can bus in, or you can cycle and transfer, in this case, the monorail, and monorail up. So again, the complete neighborhood and road hierarchy. Four lane roads serve as the super block, and they will often have commercial um, flanking them. Inside these super blocks of the four lane roads, there's your residential area with this, oh, there's the high school, uh, with the civic infrastructure. So high school, uh, there's a police and fire station down here, and parks, and this is designed to be all walkable. And then connecting the four lane super blocks and these complete neighborhoods, it can be either a four lane road again itself, or most cases as a six lane arterial, which won't have commercial or residential zoning down it, but it might have a transit connection. Busway, metro, heavy rail, light rail, monorail, you name it, you can pick either one. And then from there, you have your motorways that allow for the high speed rapid connections right across the city. But notice it doesn't cut through the neighborhoods, it serves as uh, links. Continuing, so we zoom down, so we come down to another area, so. You can see the six lane road with the four lane connections. You can see a monorail running above. There's the transit hub. So this is residential. And this is the transit hub. And we've got commercial, higher density commercial and office in here. So now we're doing a transit or and then you've got high density residential and then low density beyond that. So you're now doing your transit orientated development to build a complete neighborhood in this instance. And then you can see your intercity motorway beyond that. Flip back over to uh, the civic area. So we've now got an area with a lot of civic infrastructure. Again, you can see the road hierarchy. You can see the expressway. You can see the six lane road, which join up all the urban islands. And the urban island can be made up of one or more complete neighborhoods. You can see the four lane road forming super box. And then the two lane roads or uh, broad walks or pedestrian malls or shared spaces or transit malls form the interior of the super block to which the residential is done. But again, it's accessed by transit, walking, active modes. And in this case, I have got parking in there. I'm not totally oblivious to the fact that sometimes you've just got to drive. So that's the two examples. And again, uh, not quite transit orientated as this one, but still you can access the areas relatively well. Green utility. Green utility kicks in. In the old system, that used to be the grid. In the new system, that might not be the grid, although the grid's coming back into favour. But in the new system, driveways and garages are gone. And informal recreational spaces are used compared to formal. And this not only allows a different set of a complete neighborhood, but it also helps with stormwater filtration and runoff. This is the green utility 
grid you can see roads driveways and then you need your formal parks whereas if you go the circle and you've got in this case your civic infrastructure in the middle so your housing is back onto it you will notice in one of my other podcasts how you um, in one case your front row uh, front living room extended onto a street which became the living room in another case the living room went out the back connecting to a shared path and in, and in some cases it went both directions this is an example of it here using utility and you'll notice a lot of informal spaces spaces which also allow for stormwater uh, filtration runoff as well as being home to native flora and fauna and this is again using the simulator this is the circle example so you're able to participate in here and this is using the grid pattern both out uh, this is uh, single use so this is a slow density residential this is mixed use so if you're using the living space example in this instance um, that would extend both forwards and backwards and the same applies here all right no in this case it actually goes backwards because it goes to that there and we've got a mixed use here but yeah green utility circle for residential green utility grid for mixed use both work both have their places both can work with transit orientated developments although this will more likely be the case the point being is you've built a complete neighborhood use uh, through uh, spatial form and that influencing the behavior and in influencing the behavior you're able to walk or use transit to access your local amenities before needing to use transit to go to a metropolitan center or even city center or the car if you need to go beyond so the challenge to Auckland is we need to do better especially with our metropolitan centers in the post covid era and an example is half of south the south residents the southern Auckland's residents commutes within the south Auckland transport wanted to get that up to 80 percent we have most of our facilities close by so we've already got it there on the urban form side of the ledger it's just the transport side of the ledger is letting us down that said our town centers and local centers could be beefed up as well old papatoi uh, uh yeah old papatoi and otahu have been currently done while monaco is being currently done as a metropolitan center so in most cases the urban forms the urban geography and spatial planning side of the ledge is fine and building complete neighborhoods it's our transport side that's letting us down in conclusion uh, building complete neighborhoods is a concept often missed in auckland like roads and streets spatial planning has, has its hi hierarchy from interregional right down to site specific and the good news is our spatial planning documents recognize this but our transport planning does not each part of that spatial hierarchy spatial planning hierarchy forms an interdependent link that will result and not result in complete neighborhoods remaining complete neighborhoods you should be able to access all your local amenities within 20 minutes of walking or if you're needing to get to a metropolitan center a metropolitan center using transit the local board and the and the in terms of governance the local boards are best positioned for complete neighborhoods not the governing body not the central organization but they're not properly funded and not given the autonomy that's really needed green utility can be more effective in delivering those open spaces while saving on budgets especially in the post covid era where Auckland faces the threat of a retrenchment budget and the challenges to the institutes is to allow the complete neighborhoods and to do that you have to do all of the above and also follow the other three podcasts if we ever want to achieve that 20 minute city and eliminate the super commute in the car there are my other vision week podcasts i also have the links down below i hope these podcasts and that telling my story and my vision for vision week new zealand and creating an ambitious long-term vision for our lifestyles including economic social cultural economic and eco environmental outcomes has managed to resonate one way or the other 
again, as I take everything right back to the beginning, right stripping it right back to its foundations, because we can't get the foundations right, nothing else works. It's like building a house on sand. As soon as a flood comes through, COVID in this case, gone. Whereas if it's built on rock, resilience. Just ask tourism. Just ask the Wellington city centre at the moment. They beg workers to come back into the city centre, and the workers are going, no, they'd rather stay at home to work or work in their local metropolitan centre. Complete neighbourhoods weren't dumb. And Auckland City Centre is finding the same. So I hope these podcasts have able to resonate to something as I go right back to the beginning, right back to the foundations. Again, if you'd like to open dialogue, have a question or comment, you can contact me at ben at colab.nz. This was part four of a four-part podcast series for Vision Week New Zealand. Vision Week New Zealand is about creating an ambitious long-term vision for our lifestyle, including economic, social, cultural, and environmental incomes. Each podcast can be viewed or consumed independently, but are designed to work together in a series.